Thank you. So thank you all for coming here to listen to me. Um, my goal over the next 20 minutes is going to be to make sure this is not the least productive session for you at this amazing conference. So with the bar set pretty low for myself, uh, let me just uh, tell you a little bit about um, my background. I think Rich touched on a little bit of that. But I'm essentially, I'm an early stage investor at a venture capital firm called Lightspeed Venture Partners. So we are located in Menlo Park, California, with offices in Israel, India, and China. So I actually started my career as an engineer and an entrepreneur uh, when I was still in school at Georgia Tech. Um, the company was a spectacular flame out, complete failure, but I learned a ton about what not to do, which I think qualifies me as a venture investor quite a bit. Um, I did start a second company after that when I was in business school. That's going much better. So I did learn a few lessons from my earlier gig. Um, but then fast forward a few years, um, I joined Anderson Horowitz uh, as a partner where you, know, you heard some of the companies where I, I was involved in. And then I moved on about 18 months back um, as an investing partner at Lightspeed. So in the last uh, 18 months or so, I have invested in companies like serverless.com, Streamleo, um, and then a security company called ExaBeam, and another seed company we have in network management space. A few words about Lightspeed very quickly. The firm started about 17 years back, and uh, we manage close to about $5 billion today. Our most recent fund raised last year is a billion two fund that we are just in the early stages of deploying. Some of our recent, um, some of our portfolio companies that have been in the news recently are companies like AppDynamics, we were Series A investors, Nutanix, Series A investor, uh, Snapchat, we were seed investors, MuleSoft, Series B investors. So we actually have, um, at least we claim to have deep expertise and experience in building enterprise and consumer technology companies. So if any of you in the audience is thinking of um, starting one, do look me up offline, please. Now, I was asked to come here and share with you um, our perspective as an investor and my perspective as an investor in investing in the IoT space. So for the time we have today, I'm going to talk about the areas within the IoT ecosystem where we are spending time as investors, trying to identify you know, the businesses and the teams we should partner with. Uh, the only thing I would urge um, of, to you is that take this as one person's viewpoint so, and nothing more. So if you, have, if you have other areas that we, we are not looking at, and we should be, you know, would I would love to have that dialogue, please. Now, as an investor, whenever we are looking at a space to find opportunities to invest in, we first try to figure out if there are macro trends or driving forces that we should pay attention to. So we are not super tied to any particular thesis, because then you, are, you tend to miss the outliers. But what we do, we tend to do is we keep this blueprint in our mind as we are filtering through business plans and teams and companies in our day job. So in the IoT space, here are the trends that we feel that we are seeing, and I'll, I'll quickly walk you through, um, through this particular uh, few ones I have there. So first is the number of endpoints are increasing exponentially. So I'm going to spare you the eye chart of how the number of devices are moving up and to the right, but I think you know, we all can agree that it's really huge. Um, and then, you know, if you talk to people like Gartner, they estimate that by 2020, we should see 20 billion devices. Cisco says it's going to be 50 billion. I don't know who is right, but I know that it's going to be pretty big. The other thing is, um, if you really look at consumer and enterprise applications of IoT, it's probably split 60 and 40. 60% 60 in consumer, 40% in enterprise. Now, because of the increasing number of devices, what, what is naturally happening is the volume of data that these devices are collecting and sending back is also growing exponentially. And this is even getting worse because for every use case that you can imagine, we are collecting more data and hopefully richer data as well. The other thing that we are seeing happening quite a bit, um, and I'll talk about you know, some of the projects that we are tracking later on, is that the IoT devices, the endpoints, are actually getting smarter. I mean, they're, of course, getting cheaper, but they're actually getting smarter to the point that you can now run a stripped-down version of Linux or Android on the endpoint and actually can run some lighter applications. The other thing that's happening here is not only are they getting smarter, but the price points are falling to the level, and, and I, would argue, I would argue that it is already happening where a lot of use cases are actually finally making sense, which wasn't the case two, three years back. And the last point I'm going to make on the trend is um, the use cases are evolving quite a bit. 
So while well, the majority of the use cases, even today, tend to be data collection for visibility, control, alerting, things of that nature, we have started to see, uh, see use cases where instead of just alerting a human being, the IoT system is supposed to take an action automatically. Now, this evolving use case is having a profound impact on the infrastructure stack, the infrastructure IoT stack. We're going to touch on some of those things, but as a result of that, real-time processing, streaming technologies, event-driven computing are becoming really important when you think about investing in IoT. And IoT vendors are already exploiting some of those to create, um, to cater to some of those use cases. Now, I'm going to put up a very simple framework in terms of how we think about the IoT ecosystem. So we tend to think about the technologies and the businesses we see in the IoT in four buckets. So there is the build bucket, which is where we group all the technologies that go behind creating the device, building the device, uh, the hardware, the actual hardware. Then we, we have the managed bucket where we put all the technologies that are required for connecting, the networking, then the managing, the controlling, securing, all of that for IoT devices. Then we have the infrastructure bucket at the bottom, which is where we put all the uh, infrastructure technologies you need to cater to the emerging use cases that I've, I've been talking about, um, I was talking about just recently. And then finally, you have the DAV category where we tend to think, put all the developer resources that you need, the PaaS, the um, developer tools, the open source projects you need to kind of cater to the developers who are going to build our IoT applications. So let's talk briefly about uh, the technology in the build ecosystem. So just to be clear, I'm actually talking about real hardware, the stuff that goes into the devices. And um, you know, we investors tend to be fairly allergic to anything that f smells or feels like hardware. A lot of scar tissues we have when you know, competing with large uh, hardware manufacturers. But uh, the question is like, why am I even talking about that? Well, you know, as the devices are getting smarter, guess what? They need fancier brands i.e. You know, better processors and custom processors. And not only do they have to have custom functionality, they need to be cheap, they need to be power efficient. And you know, when it comes to building custom devices that have embedded processors today, ARM is probably the only game in town, uh, probably. I and mean, there are some other solutions as well. But given that you're trying to build devices where the price points are in low to double digit dollars, ARM is not the, probably a great misfit there. So, you know, there are some pro interesting projects out there, and one of them I'll call out is the RISC-V project out of UC Berkeley, which is the open instruction set uh, processor architecture. And the way, you know, in our naive way, we kind of almost think about it as a sort of an open source version of ARM, where you could actually use that technology to go and build custom processors in a self-serve way where you can meet the price point you need to meet to get to the market. Now, as we move, you know, once we have the devices, the next task is to hook them up and connect them to a centralized system running in the cloud. Could be public, could be private. And what I would argue is that's at this point, it feels like it's a relatively more mature ecosystem as there are a number of companies already targeting this particular aspect of the ecosystem. And I use the word relatively because it's still far from being solved. It's just that there are more companies and teams out there. Some are already shipping end-to-end -end systems consisting of um, sensors that talk to a gateway over BLE or Zigbee. The gateway talks to a cloud um, backend over Wi-Fi or cellular. And the use cases they are handling is mostly around visibility, analytics, alerting, running on the cloud. And then some of the other approaches that we have seen is uh, companies taking their software, uh, it's mostly SDKs, trying to partner with device manufacturers the device manager, manufacturers use those SDKs to embed in their devices, and the startups build the rest of the backend, which is the gateway and the cloud uh, backend as well. Now, in our view, we tend to think that you know, as devices get smarter and they come built with network connections, and as uh, some of the standardization happens on the connection side, the protocol side, the opportunity for some of these startups might shrink in the long run, just, just in our view. Um, the opportunity, the part of the ecosystem where we think there's a lot of opportunity and we are very bullish about is once you have these devices connected, how do you manage them? Now, managing is a loaded term. So, you know, it, for us, it covers a bunch of things. First is monitoring. So once you have the IoT, IoT solution in place, how do you know what's going wrong and what is going wrong? A device might be 
offline because it has run, of, uh, run out of power, or it might be sending data in the wrong format. Now, a corollary to monitoring is debugging. So as devices get smarter, you are running applications on the endpoint. So there's a need now to debug when an application is not running properly on the endpoint. Um, now, the question is like, you know, has this problem not been solved already in the IT world? Yes, but the scale at which uh, this problem has been solved for the IT world is very different from the scale that you are going to see in the I IoT world, which is like several orders of magnitude more uh, devices and data volume. So we, we definitely think there are a lot of opportunities there. The other um, area that we are spending a lot of time in this particular um, part of the ecosystem is security. So if you look at traditional IT security approaches, they have been designed to secure hundreds of servers, maybe low thousands of endpoints in you know, mobile phones, tablets, um, and laptops at best. But um, the other point about the traditional IT techniques is the servers and the endpoints have powerful compute available. So you can run agents on the endpoints to gather data, to detect a security breach, and once you detect it, you can actually apply some kind of policy or enforcement policy to stop that breach. None of that exists in an IoT world where your endpoints do not have such sophisticated compute. It's getting better, but it's far from there where you can run agents to collect and apply security policies. So the approaches we are seeing in securing IoT devices has a lot to do with machine learning and kind of profiling the devices from observing how they uh, operate in a, in a in an ideal condition, and then trying to come up with the policies automatically, and then trying to uh, secure those devices using those policies at the network level. It's a very different, it's a wholly different class of technique than that we have seen in the past in the IT world. Now, the final task within the management layer where we think there are still in a lot of opportunities is the patch delivery. So, you know, those patches could be firmware upgrades, could be OS upgrades, could be application, you know, different versions of the applications. But you need to deliver those to the endpoints over the network connection that could be patchy at times. So how do you manage all of that? How do you build a stack where you are not dependent on the network as much, or at least you build some fault tolerance in that? And we are seeing some companies that are trying to solve that part of the problem. Now, the bottom line that I'm trying to make here is the techniques, the problems exist today in the IT world, but they are not going to translate very easily to the IoT world because of two things. One is device count, and the other is data volume. So as a result, we are seeing a lot of uh, very interesting ideas and teams going after this particular uh, part of the ecosystem. Now, at a fundamental, um, oh, sorry. At a fundamental level, I strongly believe um, there are a lot of opportunities in the infrastructure IT stack that you need to build below all this monitoring or securing part of the ecosystem. And you know, that's the part where, that's the part of the ecosystem where we are probably spending the most time and we are probably most bullish about. Now we strongly believe that the infrastructure we have today is not going to sustain in a world where you have billions of devices sending petabytes of data. Um, so I, I want to touch on a few different aspects or a few different needs of this infrastructure and you know, where we are spending time. So first is real time. So as more and more devices get connected, they transmit a lot of data that need to be managed and analyzed continuously across large data sets. So now these specific capabilities um, are new, and I would, I would argue that you know, they're very specific to the IoT use cases that are emerging today with all the autonomous cars and the you know, OT kind of use cases that we are seeing. So we are seeing you know, a lot of smart enter entrepreneurs building the next generation of data processing technologies that is moving away from batch processing, getting into real time. And there are like a bunch of you know, open source projects out there. We actually have invested behind a couple of those that are trying to go after that particular problem and trying to solve it with real-time data processing systems. The second is event-driven infrastructure. So in the traditional world, we are used to standing up servers, physical or virtual. We are used to standing up those servers that cater to clients. The clients can be a mobile, mobile app or a web app. And you know, the server, you run the server, pretty much nonstop, you know, trying to cater to the client request. In an IoT world where you have billions of devices and not, most of them are sending probably sparse data, you don't want to stand the uh, kind of server infrastructure you normally would to ca cater to that kind of use cases because the cost is just unsustainable. You cannot do that. So people are turning the problem on its head and they are trying, going after the event-driven paradigm where 
you only come up with the server-side application when there is a request from the device. So we actually invested in a company called serverless.com, which is based on this serverless or event-driven paradigm, where you only stand up a serverless server-side application when there is a request from the device side. The final piece here, in terms of what you need from this next generation infrastructure, is edge computing. So as both you know, device count and data volume increase, it's kind of imperative that the data processing um, needs to move away from a central model to a more distributed model. So more needs to happen on the edge because you don't want to send all the data back to the central, um, wherever you are running your applications. So you know, it saves time and money, it's better efficiency, and it prevents the need to overwhelm your databases that are running centrally. Now, you know, um, as devices, IoT devices are getting smarter, the point I was making earlier, um, beyond that, you know, beyond not overwhelming your central data processing system, the other need is you can actually run applications and not just analytics on the edge. So it might sound a bit like science fiction today, but we strongly believe that in a few years out, your um, um, data processing system will probably be not confined within a few servers in a light, lights out data center. More, more importantly, it will be the distributed systems will be truly distributed, some processing happening on the edge, some in the gateway, some maybe in a data center in a closet, and then some that absolutely need to happen in the cloud will go to the cloud. But what now, you know, you, you might imagine if that happens, you, you, that throws up a whole set of challenges. How do you monitor? How do you deploy? How do you debug? How do you secure these truly distributed systems? So we are spending a lot of time over there trying to um, you know, um, sort through some really interesting companies we have seen lately. Uh, the final point I would make here is um, catering to the developers. So no matter what you do, what you build, um, eventually you need to get developers adopt that framework so that they can build applications that can eventually cater to the use cases. So open source is a big part of uh, our focus as an as a investment firm. Obviously, Apache has done a great job there. And then we are looking at a um, lot of dev tools, a lot of PaaS kind of solutions that help developers build applications that go on and run on this new infrastructure and the new IoT systems that, uh, that are coming to the market. Now, no talk on uh, IoT can end without a cautionary note. So you know, as investors, we have been looking at the IoT space for, I would say, four or five years now. And every year, it feels like the market is going to take off this year. Right? It hasn't happened yet. So the reason, question is, why, why, is, why has the market underperformed uh, over the years? The first problem is monetization. So we can talk about all the interesting infrastructure needs and all the uh, different kinds of uh, monitoring and securing solutions for IoT. The problem is, it's very difficult to charge a respectable amount of money to secure or monitor an endpoint which only costs a few dollars or even less. I mean, we didn't have that problem on the traditional IT side because the servers and the mobile phones and tablets, they cost several orders more, uh, magnitude more. In the IoT world, that business model needs to evolve. We are seeing some uh, initial um, work on that, but it's far from to a point where we can say, well, you know, this is the business model that's going to create the next billion dollar company in this space. That also brings me to the next uh, point, which is fragmented use cases. So if you look at the, most of the uh, IoT use cases, and specifically uh, on the enterprise side, which is where I spend more of my time, fra use cases are fairly fragmented. So some of the bigger use cases, like temperature monitoring, things like that, are probably a few hundred million dollar market. And most other use cases are smaller than that. So the question or the challenge is how do you build an IoT, not only from a technology standpoint, IoT system from a technology standpoint, but also from a business model standpoint that can cut across multiple use cases so that you can capture a much wider market across all of those. And then um, you know, the other point I would make here is um, interoperability. So I was actually um, looking at a McKinsey study some time back, and you know, some of them mentioned that 40% of value from an IoT solution could be lost if we do not take care of interoperability. And you know, we might debate about the exact number, but I, I truly believe that is the case, that is going to be the case, because unless we have standards and open protocols, a lot of the solutions will be custom solutions, and a lot of the, and a lot of the startups will struggle to break into this ecosystem. So that needs to happen. So in summary, I would say, you know, at summer, you know I would kind of uh, categorize our, invest, our uh, sentiment in this market as cautiously optimistic. Um, and there are two things that's happening 
in this market which makes us more optimistic uh, than before. So first is we are finally, finally seeing emer the emergence of real use cases with real ROI. So it's happening on the consumer side with autonomous cars and smart homes. It's definitely happening, probably happening more on the enterprise side with OT kind of use cases as well as in a smart energy and service management kind of use cases. So the use cases are finally emerging where somebody is saying, okay, I have a budget. If you can improve my efficiency or if you can you know, help me diagnose my, you know, um, you know, the failures uh, much better than I could do before. The second part, second thing that's happening is the underlying technology stack has matured a lot in the last five, seven years because of all the stuff that's happening on the big data side. So techniques such as machine learning, streaming, and all the big data processing we have seen are finally matured enough where they can cater to those use cases. So the convergence of those two trends make us very optimistic than we were probably two, three years back. Still very early in an awfully large market. So at Lightspeed, we continue to be super bullish about this space, spending a lot of time here. Um, so any of you planning to build a billion dollar company in this space, do look me up. Thank you. Thank you for listening and for your time.